Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to approach the throne with clarity of response. You said that if we pray anything according to will, you hear us, and when you hear us, you will respond with an answer. It will be a positive answer in the Word of God. It may not always be on schedule as we desire, but it will always be in perfect timing. I lift the Deloaches before you today as a special request for their health, uh, for any needs that they might have that the church could reach out to, would be a great service opportunity for many of us, and certainly for prayer. We have many, Father, today that are, are sick or going through recoveries of surgeries and all different kinds of things that we let them collectively to you. And, and for Mother's Day, uh, many of us, our, our mothers are, are gone there. We're not going to be able to give them a call or send them a gift or uh, say a word of thanks. Uh, we had those great opportunities while they were alive, and many of us took advantage of that. But today, Father, we look at something that has caught our nation since COVID. Just a sense of depression that has brought to Mother's Day a kind of a cloud over it. We look at the shootings that have taken our, our kids and leave grieving mothers this year. The, the Nashville Church and the Texas Mall are examples of it in current news. And for all those mothers today and for all those who have left their mothers, their mothers have left us. And for all the mothers who's had to bury their children, I lift them before you, Father, and pray that our nation is in a dilemma, a sure enough bad place. And the church needs to rise to the occasion and be a, a, a beacon of light and hope. And I pray that we would be that church in Jesus' name. Amen. I was going to turn away. I'm in a study on Toledoth 1, which is Genesis, the second chapter, verse 4, through the fourth chapter, 26. I was going to turn away from it because I'm in chapter 4. And I just couldn't get away from it. The text that I have is a sad text on Mother's Day. But then our nation is in a sad place as it is. There are a lot of grieving mothers this Mother's Day that weren't grieving last Mother's Day uh, because of evil. Evil. What they did in the Nashville, what they did in the Nashville church and in the Texas mall was evil. It was evil. And we're first introduced to this idea in my text, which is in Genesis, the fourth chapter, if you'll open your Bibles to it. I'm looking at 8 through 11. The two boys, Cain and Abel, the two children of Adam and Eve, it come a point in their life where they had made their career change. It's called the rite of passage. They have already gone through the rite of passage in their career, and now it's a rite of passage into their spiritual relationship with God. And they are, they are told to bring an offering to the Lord, which would be symbolic of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a blood offering to represent that the Lamb of God would one day come and die on a cross and be buried and raised from the dead. Jesus in John, the first chapter 29, is referred to as the Lamb of God that's come to take away 
the sin of the world. This is what this story is about. And a terrible, terrible thing happened as a result of the two boys bringing a sin offering on the day for atonement of the rite of passage. And Cain brought, he was a farm, uh, uh, agricultural farm person. He brought the best of his crops. He brought the very best he had to God as an offering for sin. Abel, who tended the flock, brought a specific sin offering, a, a lamb without blemish and spot as an offering for sin. That's what God required. Abel's offering as a result of that was accepted and Cain's offering was not accepted. And Cain got all bent out of shape, as we might say. And what happened was Cain got so angry that he murdered his brother. Murdered his brother. As the story's picked up, Cain told Abel, his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and murdered him. You can't see it in the English, but in the Hebrew, the knife that he used was the sacrificial knife used to um, kill the lamb and get his blood. It was called a sacrificial knife, and it was used specifically for atonement. And so he, in spite, takes the sacrificial knife to the field with him and kills his brother, cuts his throat, and leaves him to die. The Lord said to Cain, verse 9, where is Abel, your brother? You suppose the Lord didn't know where he was? Well, but later he's going to say, I knew exactly where he was. But this is to get a confession, isn't it? Where is your brother Abel? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The truth of the matter is he was his brother's keeper. The truth of the matter is we all are. We are all our brother's keepers. He said, what have you done? What have you done? See, he's asked him two questions. What have you, got, what have you done? And, and notice that Abel answered with a question to God. It shows arrogance. God can ask you questions. What kind of questions are you going to ask him that would challenge his identity of authority? He said, what have you done? The, listen to me. And before Abel could, before Cain could answer, he said, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And then he goes on to tell him, you are now cursed. And he puts a sentence on him. Okay? He, he, he expels him from society. They didn't have prisons, but they isolated him from society. It was a terrible punishment, and next week we'll talk more in, in regard to that. So when I read that, I thought, what a, what a terrible day in the life of Eve. And I thought, as I looked at this, what a terrible Mother's Day for her. Because, listen, she lost both of her sons in one evil event in her life. She lost both of them. He lost Abel by Cain murdering him. His own brother murdered him. And she lost Cain because he was expelled from society by God. When I was a young teenager, maybe a freshman or sophomore in high school, I was raised by my grandparents my, my whole life. My father was killed in the Second World War, and I was raised by my grandparents. 
And my uncle Leo died. He was the first in our family. He was the oldest son, and he was young. He was like 50 uh, when he died. And so we all went to the funeral. My grandmother wanted me at the graveside to be with her. And so I stood with my grandma at the, grandmother at the graveside. And I kept hearing my grandmother murmur, and I would lean over to see what she might be saying closer. And I couldn't quite distinguish it listening to the minister and everybody else. When it, the funeral was over, I asked my grandmother what she was asking me. I thought maybe she wanted a drink or a drink of water or something. You know, I, I had no, she said, she said to me, Ronnie, it's just not right. And I said, well, grandmother, what isn't just right? She said, it, is, it just isn't right that a parent should bury a child. Children should be burying parents, not the other way around. Now, my uncle died of a heart attack, but, you know, he didn't die because somebody murdered him in this case. But I thought to myself, what a tragic event this would be in the life of this mother, this Mother's Day, Eve, who has lost both children in an evil event. And then I thought, because of the news has been so, we've had this since COVID. We, ha we haven't come out of COVID well as church. We're still with depression and anxieties, uncertainties in our life. We have lost since COVID, we have lost a lot of people, a lot of people. There are a lot of people today on this Mother's Day that will be grieving. That when they all gather together, there will be a lot of mourning. And I thought about that. I thought about how difficult it must be for grieving mothers on Mother's Day. So I wanted to try to bring you some kind of comfort and hope from that. This was a tragic event. I hope this would never happen to anybody. But this happened to a family that were believers, with the exception of Cain. How difficult, I thought, it must have been for Eve to lose both sons in such a terrible event. Then I realized what had happened in Nashville's church and what had happened at the Texas Mall. These little kids murdered and I thought, where have we come as a nation? We just seem to be filled with violence. And listen, I don't think our community in Moody is not going to be touched by all of this. I think this stuff is spreading like wildfire. And I just think just because we live out in a suburb area like Moody, that somehow we will not be touched by this kind of evil. I think it's nearer to your doorstep than you might imagine. So I want to talk about four things this morning to bring some hope to grieving mothers. I don't know how many in here might be grieving, but I know that through our internet, there's a lot of them. And so this message will be going to the other ends of the earth, to grieving mothers. And I hope they will take account of this idea. Here's what's interesting to me. The devil had enough confidence to walk into the home of three believers, that's Adam and Eve and Abel, and target the one son who wasn't a believer and convince him to kill his brother. Where did he get that kind of confidence that he could do that? Listen to me, maybe past history. Maybe past history. He was very familiar with his family. Satan was very familiar with his family. 
he had already visited this family once before. He got Eve to eat from the tree that caused the death to be spread upon all mankind. Romans 5.12. Wherefore is by one man sin the world and death by sin. That's Adam. And so it was spread upon all mankind, the sin death. See, he was already familiar with his family. He had already dialogued with his family once before and got them to take the bait. That's in Genesis 3. So he felt pretty confident that he could march right into that home and get another one. Let me tell you what the devil's out after because we're all going to be touched by him at some point in our life. He's after destroying Christ in your life. If you're not a believer, he's opposed to you becoming one. If you are a believer, he's opposed to you believing in it. Your life should be all about Christ. If you believe he died for your sins, yours, was buried and raised from the dead to give you eternal life, when you put your faith in that, you get it. Now that you've got it, what you do with it? Now that, you're, now that you've been born again, now that you're a Christian, what do you do with it? See, that's the issue. Because there's only two games in town. Either you think worldly or you think divine viewpoint. Either the Bible is an important book for you or it's not. If the Bible is not an important book for you and you say you've been born again, that's worldly thinking because the Bible is the only book for you. It's the only book in town. This is the eternal word of God. It will be the one book in heaven that you, will, you, you, you should be familiar with before you get there. So Satan is very bold. He walks right up to this house and into it. And he's after one thing. Destroy the seed of Christ. Destroy the seed. Of, destroy Christ. Now look. Where does evil come from? Let me show you on your paper. I said under point one, I said, where does evil come from? Here's how you do it. You take the word devil and take the D off. What do you get? Evil. You know where evil comes from? It comes from the devil. And this story proves it. This story proves it. Among all the many stories in the Bible, this one proves it. If you want to know where evil comes from, it comes from the devil. It comes from the devil. The devil had to get Cain influenced enough to kill his own brother. The devil can't walk in and kill his brother. He has to convince Cain to do it, to destroy the whole seed line of Christ. 1 John 5, 19. Listen to this. You know that you are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. You either are in God or you're in, which is divine righteous, you're either in God and righteous through Christ or you're in the world and evil. You are under the influence of the God of this world who is Satan. And it depends how much of the Bible you know, how much influence you are under him. The less Bible you know, the less Bible you know, the more influence you are under him. That's the problem with Cain. He'd go to church, never listen. The preacher would encourage him. And he would blow it off. You think you're going to get through life with that? You think you're going to come out clean on that deal? The only person you're fooling is yourself. 
And let me tell you, the risk is too high for you to be stupid. Because when you die, there's more to life than death. You're, there's a life after death that you're going to have to face. Now, you may not like to hear this. I didn't when I heard it. But let me tell you, you're not going to come out clean, clean unless you go to the cross of Jesus Christ. He came into this world to die for you. If there was no one else in this whole wide world, he came to die for you. Well, what are you going to do with that? Every year you hear it and every year you blow it off. I know that. I did it. Because it sounds so screwy that if you believe that Jesus came, died, was buried, and raised, that your life could be dramatically changed by the power of God. But it's true. It's absolutely 100% true. And you need to come to grips with that. You see, where does evil come from? It comes from the devil. Let me ask you, where does sin come from? Jesus didn't die on the cross for evil. But he did die on the cross for sin. So where does sin come from? It came from Adam. You were born a sinner, not because you sin. You're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. You were born a sinner. The only way that can be removed from your life is the blood of Jesus Christ. You've got to accept that. You've got to believe that. And why would you not? Why would you not believe that? He's not asked one thing from you. He doesn't say, okay, now you've got to join the church. He doesn't say that. Oh, now you've got to give your money. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say any of that. That's stuff that you thought up. He never requires, he requires nothing from you except to believe. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. You need to listen to me today. You're playing Russian roulette with your soul. You must stop that. Where does sin come from? Well, it comes from Romans 5.12. Wherefore, by one man, Adam, sinned into the world, and death by sin, and so it spread to all mankind. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 28, it says, Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sin of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. Christ is going to come again, and it won't be for sin. He came the first time for sin. Listen, today is the day of salvation. It's not tomorrow, it's today. And you need to quit playing with your soul, Russian roulette. I'm telling you the absolute truth. Point number two. The devil was able to convince Cain, that's worldly thinking, that the devil promotes out of Genesis 3, 1 through 7, in 1 Timothy 2, 14, and 2 Corinthians 11, 2, which give you information about how his strategy is against your soul. The devil uses human thinking as a strategy against your soul. A strategy against your soul. He did it with Cain, and he'll do it with you. He did it with Cain. Cain thought he could be a good guy, do the best he could, and go to heaven when he dies. Not so. That's why God sent his only begotten son into the world to die one death for all sin for all people. You're not too bad to get saved and you're not too good. Listen, it depends on your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's pure and simple. This is not complicated. Satan was the only 
Satan has the only power permitted by God, according to Job 1, 8, and 2, 3. In 1 John 4, 4, we are told, you are of God, little children, that's born again, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you, that is the Holy Spirit of God, the third member, than Satan who's in the world. The only power in your life greater than Satan is the Holy Spirit. The moment you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence inside your body. Your body becomes a temple of God, and now you have the power to face off on the devil and beat him at his own game. That's the only power. There's no other power that can beat him. But you have that inner power in you if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Paul writes Ephesians, the sixth chapter, in verse 10, he gives you a, a warning shot over the bow, so to speak. And then he goes on to talk about how the Christian must wear the full armor of God and, and how to fight the devil in his daily life. Listen to what he says in verse 10 to the Christian. Be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Right there at the bottom of your paper. Be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. It's the only way you can beat the devil. It is the only way you can beat the devil. And you can beat him every day at his own game. Paul goes on in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and he tells the Christian to put on the full armor of God. And listen to how, why he says you should do it. He says you will be able to stand against. Stand against. Now watch the word against. Against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is against rulers, powers, world forces of darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the world system under the control of Satan. That's exactly what he's talking about. In 1 Timothy 6.12, Paul tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. <clears throat> Point three. You know, De De Goliath, I put on your paper Goliath. That's how De Goliath beat, that's how David beat Goliath. You didn't pay attention when I said the word against up there. Put on the full armor of God that, that you may stand against. If you count the word against, when you count the word against, you're going to five five. uses it five times. Therefore, you go into the battle of five to one odd not to win if you don't know how to fight. That, you go in five to one. Well, listen. Stand against the schemes of the devil, not flesh and blood, against rulers, against powers, against world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of weaknesses. You are already five to one odds on, on him to beat you unless you know how to wear the full armor of God. You're already down five to one. And you can beat him every time, but you got to fight it by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God and using it. You got to know how to fight it. You got to know how to fight it. Satan is confident that he can beat you every, any day, anywhere, anytime. He goes in with a five to one odd to beat you. And he will get you if you don't know how to wear the full armor of God. You have the power to resist him. You have the power to defeat him, but not in yourself. In yourself, you're a dead duck. You're a dead duck. And so, David goes out, not prepared for warfare. The odds are much bigger than five to one when he faces Goliath. 
and he beats him. You know how he beats him? He beats him by faith. That's how we always beat him. We beat him by faith. Point number three, our problem, here's our problem with evil. Our problem is that we tend to blame and make issues out of flesh and blood, such as we blame the victim, we blame the family, we blame the weapon. You know, God never blamed the weapon. His weapon of choice was a knife, a sacrificial knife. Not one time did God blame him for that. He blamed the person that committed the murder and not the weapon. Didn't blame the choice of weapon. All of that is a way to distract from dealing with the problem. When you blame the victim, that doesn't work. You blame the family, that doesn't work. Weapons of choice doesn't work. Society, blame society. Blame Christianity, blame God. We always want to blame somebody. You know, the old idea, we point one finger out and three fingers are pointing back. We never face the three fingers pointing back. We tend to get distracted by motives. The devil loves the fact that we get distracted by motives rather than cause and source. What was Cain's motive to kill Abel? Well, here's what it says. What was the cause and the source? It's found in 1 John 3, 12. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother, and for what reason? See, motive. Did he slay him? Listen to me. Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. How about that? See, we always want to, we see evil, it is so bad that we think there's got to be some kind of a logical motive or reason for it. Once we research it, we find that it's just not there. It's just stupid. It's a person that has mental problems or it's a, a person that's this or that or that. It doesn't matter. You can't blame this stuff away. What you have to do when you say, listen, what happened? What has been happening is evil. What is happening on the six o'clock news day after day after day is evil. It's not sin, it's evil. It is evil. And everybody's trying to, trying to figure out motive and cause and they, they give blame on everything. Nobody talks about the cause and the source of evil. My, 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 if you leave here today, learn this. The, the source and the course of evil is the devil. If you take the D off, it tells you where evil comes from. You're not going to find answers for evil unless you understand the source and the cause and right off the bat, we have a murder, and God shows us this system and how to fight it and how to beat it. And we need to be smarter than this. We need to be smarter than this. In concluding, the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now listen to me. I want to I talk of how do, how do I get out of my grieving that just swallows me up and destroys me. All right? Watch this. The indwelling Holy Spirit that comes at a point of salvation to anyone who believes the gospel in the church age, he is called, the Holy Spirit is called the great comforter. John chapters 14, 15, and 16, Jesus lays this thing out beautifully in a long discussion on the Holy Spirit's power when he comes into your life. John 14, 15, and 16. I mentioned a few verses, but you should read those chapters. Jesus said in John, the seventh chapter, 38 and 39, if anyone, if anyone, listen to me, would you do something for me? Do it for yourself. See the word any, anyone? Put your name there. Just write it above it. 
write your name above it. Because it reads different. Because it's meant to be personal. If anyone, if anyone, if Ron is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being, from his innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. What does that take care of? Listen to me, thirst. How much thirst? Listen to me now. How much? All of it. How much thirst? Let me tell you. The devil wants, listen, he creates a thirst in you for the things of the world that will destroy you. It'll destroy you. You'll be an addict. It'll destroy you. Jesus came along and he says, I know your thirst. Don't go to the world anymore. Stop going to the world to meet your need of thirst. I will meet it every day in the most significant, wonderful way. You're going to the wrong place. You're going to the wrong well to drink poison water. When you go to the world's well to drink, you're drinking poison water. A little poison today, a little poison tomorrow, and eventually you're dead. Jesus, come to my well and you, you will never thirst again. My water involves your living. He called it your living water. Not your dying water. You go to the world's well and you will die. You go to the Lord's well and you'll live. You'll live abundantly. That's a promise made to your life and you ought to grab it. But this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were about to receive. The Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not died, buried, raised, and ascended back to the Father. The great comforter lives inside every church age believer. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He doesn't come a little bit later. He comes right on the dime. The moment you believe the gospel, he enters your life and your body becomes a temple of God. The believer is told, now that you have the Holy Spirit, walk in his power. In Galatians 5, 16, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. In Galatians 5, 22, 23, he says, when you walk in the Spirit, you will get the fruit of the Spirit. And he lists nine. If you walk in the Spirit, you get the fruit of the Spirit. You get nine things. You get love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. They're given to you by the grace of God as a gift. Now I want you to see something. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians, and I'm going to close my session. I want you to go, I'm going to let you off the hook. The Lord has you on a hook. And I'm not going to press it in your life, but he has got you. He's got you like he had me. I sat in the upper balcony so that when he gave an invitation, I wasn't going to be a part of it. First Corinthians 13, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you the connection. Now, I said to you the subject of my lesson was grieving mother's hope. There is a hope for grieving mothers and you must attach yourself to it. A hope. A hope that you can attach to a life that has been deprived of a loved one. But I'm going to show you how they're attached. I gave you Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, right? Now pay attention. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. Now watch this, because I'm going to make a connection that's going to, going to be a light bulb. 
Watch this. He said, love is. Love is patient. He's talking about God's love. God's love is patient. It's kind, not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. Love does not, un- does not act un- unbecomingly. It does not speak its own. It's not provoked. Does not take to account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth. Watch this now. Watch this. Watch this. This is what love can do in your life. The love of God can do in your life. Watch this now. Verse 7. God's love bears all things, believes all things, and what? Hopes what? All things. Now listen to me. Hope was not one of the fruit of the Spirit. Agreed? I, I listed them up there. It's not, it's not a fruit of the Spirit, is it? Hmm. Not a direct one. But it is an indirect one because it works off from the fruit of love. Right? What was the very, in Galatians 5, 22, 23, what was the first fruit of the Spirit mentioned? Love. That's God's love, love. Where does he say hope for all things come from? God's love. Do you understand? Where does hope for all things come from? It comes from the love of God. Where does the love of God come from? Listen, it comes from the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. In your hour of grief, God will touch your soul with with his love. And with that love, he's going to say to your soul, it's going to be okay. I've got this. And it's going to bring elpis to you. It's going to bring confident expectation that God has got it all under control. The word hope is elpis. It means confident expectation that God has it all. But listen, look how God brings hope for all things to your life. He brings it through the word love, which is the God's love that's in you in the Holy Spirit of God. You've got to understand how this thing works. See how hope works? Oh, hope's a wonderful thing. Hope is a wonderful, confident expectation that God has everything under control. My life's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. When you turn to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he's going to put, he's going to manifest that love in you. And out of that love in you, he's going to say in the secrecy of your own heart, in a wonderful way, Everything's going to be okay, honey. Everything's going to be okay. So those of you, those of you that have gone through grieving spells this year or in the last two or three years, this is how you overcome that in your life. This is how you overcome it. As Christians, this is the system that God has set up that you can drink from living water, water that makes your life healthy and wonderful and strong. Thank you for your patience. Listen, just because I'm releasing this doesn't mean that you're being released. Boy, I'm going to tell you, you need to pay attention to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. He has been all over this place today. John, the 17th chapter, the Holy Spirit brings great conviction when the gospel is preached, and you need to pay attention to that because what God wants to do is rescue you from the muck and the mire of your life. And if you'll surrender, he'll do it. If you'll believe that he has the power to transform your life, he'll do it. He'll do it. 
But you got to come his way. You can't come Cain's way and think you're going to make it. God sent his son to be on the cross for on your behalf, to die a terrible death, to take away your hell, to give you inner peace that will last forever. Boy, you don't need to pass that deal up. So our Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way. I know, Father, it's been kind of a crazy Mother's Day sermon. There's so many mothers grieving today that I wanted to give them some hope and how they can click into it when they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit enters into their life. It becomes a well to the thirsty for life, a living water, a water that brings life to us and time and eternity. We've discovered today, Father, that hope is such a powerful idea, but it comes through a system to the Christian life. The ministry of the Holy Spirit the fruit of the Spirit is love, and love is this magnificent thing. And Paul goes in and talks about what all love can do, and then he gets down to our point. Bears all things, hopes in all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Oh, Father, thank you for that. Love, God's love never fails. May we, may we never listen to the devil tell us one day that the love of God can fail in our life. It can never fail, but it's got to be operated by a great ministry of the Holy Spirit. I pray for that today over this church in Jesus' name. Amen.